So well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's really great to be here at this TEDx event for me. And the story I'm going to tell you is about music and the brain. So it's about neuroscience, and probably all of you have heard about the so-called Mozart effect. So this is the so-called effect that just listening to a sonata of Mozart for 10 minutes should increase your IQ. So do you think this is, this is possible? So probably I have to disappoint you, it's not. It's a myth. But uh, what about playing a musical instrument over years and years? Does this change our perception, our cognitive skill, and does it change our brain? So we had a great opportunity to investigate this question when accompanying a musical education program running in northern Germany, uh, which is now available to about 60,000 children. It's called Jedem Kind ein Instrument, or Yeki, which means an instrument for every child. And the children have the opportunity to learn this instrument at primary school almost for free. And we had the great opportunity to study uh, possible benefits for children uh, on a long-term scale, so in a long longitudinal study. And our study is called AMSL, which means Audio and Neuroplasticity of Musical Learning. And we were interested in positive effects, particularly also in children with learning disorders, so we, with reading and writing difficulties, uh, dyslexia, and also with ADHD, but also in normal children. And I will show you the most interesting results of this study, which is still going on now here. So, what did we measure? We were interested in the social background of the children, so in their musical practicing behavior, and we did that by questionnaires. Uh, in addition, we were interested in the auditory skills, so how are the hearing abilities, and we did that by different hearing tests. And we measured different cognitive abilities by psychological tests, uh, like intelligence, creativity, reading and writing skills, attention, math skills, and so on. And we were interested also in the brain. Uh, we, were, we were looking at the brain anatomy and in the brain function. So we did that with MRI and with so-called uh, MEG here. And now I come to the most interesting results. So the first thing we did was that we separated our children into two groups, those who did play a musical instrument and those who did not or practiced very little. And the musicians are indicated in yellow here in the following, and the non-musicians are indicated in blue here. So the first thing we were interested in was auditory perception. So what we found was that these musicians were significantly better at discriminating different sounds. So is it a high or a low tone? Is it, does it sound similar or different? So the so-called timbre of the tones, tone duration, or are those rhythms similar or different? And not very surprising, musicians performed better. Uh, but what about the cognitive abilities? So we also found that musicians were better um, at their attentional abilities, they showed less impulsivity and they showed less hyperactivity. So behavior that is re relevant for ADHD. So they showed less symptoms of ADHD, if you like so. And they also performed significantly better at reading and writing skills. And I will show this now here in a graph. And what you see here is performance for different aspects of reading and writing skills. And the uh, red line marks the age norm, which means what would be expected from children of that age. And you see that the non-musicians here in blue nicely conform to those expectations. But the musicians here in yellow, they outperform their untrained peers by a percentage of about 10. So they have an increase in reading and writing skills of 10%. And you, you may say, this is great, but is this just a side effect of positive um, um, social background? Are child, uh, children of parents who are well-educated more likely to be sent to music lessons? 
And in order to control for that, we estimated the social background extensively by questionnaires. We um, extracted all important factors, like, for instance, education environment, but also resources, leisure activities like other courses, uh, like, for instance, um, arts or um, chess playing, and so on and so forth. And we statistically eliminated those influences from our cal calculations, and we found that the musicians were still better at reading and writing skills. So we can say it's really a music-specific effect. So this is now about behavior. It's about hearing and about uh, cognition. We know the hearing abilities are better, and so are some cognitive skills. But what about brain function? So we were also interested in that, and here you see a very good colleague and friend of mine. We have been doing this uh, study here together. And on the right-hand side, you see an MRI scanner to measure the brain volume of the children uh, and particular structures that are relevant for us, and uh, MEG to measure brain function when we are listening to different sounds. And here you see so-called auditory cortex, as it looks like. So every one of us has such structures in our brain. Um, we have a right and a left auditory cortex, and the most important structure is now here indicated in colors. It's so-called Heschel's gyrus. And it's very important to discriminate different sounds, and so it's also important for uh, um, comprehending music and speech. And here you see some examples uh, of the auditory brains of our children. And on the right hand, hand side, we have the musicians. On the left side, we have the non-musicians. And those are just examples. And, and, and on the bottom, you see the average brain volume for the whole group. And probably you see it, the uh, right um, Heschel's gyrus is about double size in the musicians here. So there is a large difference. And when we compare it to musical abilities, we find that the size of this structure directly corresponds to musical abilities of the children. So what would you expect? So is this just because the brain has grown like a well-trained muscle? It looks like, doesn't it? And so here on the next graph, you see how the size of this brain structure uh, relates to the motivation of the children to practice their musical instrument at home. So this is the training behavior here, and we have a high correlation, you would say. Um, and this is our idea that due to musical practice, the brain structure has grown like a well-trained muscle. But if this is really the case, you would expect that the size of this brain structure changes um, over time, so over years. And we did a long-term study, I told you, and so we were measuring this structure right at the beginning of the study, when the children almost had no musical experience, and years later here. And what we saw, and that was a big surprise for us, was that they almost did not differ. So they looked really the same. And so how can you explain that? So the only uh, explanation is that the structure was there in advance and it, that it was responsible for the motivation of the children to play and practice musical instrument. Or in other words, you would say this is something like a neural marker of musical aptitude in the brain. So that we found that very interesting. Uh, so this is about aptitude, but does it mean that there is no neuroplasticity and learning in the brain at all? So in order to test that, we measured brain activation, and um, we presented different musical sounds to the children, uh, like those, you will hear them now. <laughs> yes, and we were interested in the time it takes from the ear to the brain to activate the brain. So very simple, because this is a measure of the neural efficiency, so how well the auditory system can transmit auditory information. And now we compared our groups according to this measure here. And we have our musicians group, we had the non-musicians, and we also had a group of ADHD children here. 
And right at the beginning of the study, when musical experience was still low, we got the following result. So we found that um, even after a relatively short time of musical practice, uh, response time from the ear to the brain was fastest in the musicians and it was slowest in the ADHD group. So the musicians had an initial advantage. And as the children grew older, we would naturally expect that the neural efficiency of the auditory system becomes even better. So response time decreases in all children. That's well known from neuro neuroscience. But if you compare our three groups now here, what do we see? So that happened over time. So you see that the initial advantage of the musicians still increased over time, so they got an accumulated advantage according to auditory processing in the brain, while the ADHD uh, children had an initial uh, disadvantage in their developmental speed. So, and we were also interested in hemispheric asymmetries. I told you we have two auditory cortex, so we compared the responses of both sides here. And those are real data you see here. Those are our uh, non-musicians. And um, the responses you see, they, are they have a slight delay, so they are not really exactly the same here. So if we compare that now, so um, I've forgotten to say that uh, right auditory cortex is indicated here in, in red and left auditory cortex in blue. And if, if we compare it to our musicians here, we see that both sides are in almost perfect synchrony here. So, and uh, in addition, the responses are larger and they are faster. So all signs of a highly efficient auditory processing in the brain. So now we have a look, look at the children with ADHD. And what we found here was that the auditory brains of those children did not interact at all. So every side did a different thing. And so we were really surprised and we were wondering, may, is it possible that those children encounter auditory problems that have um, negative effects on attention and probably might playing a musical instrument help here? And in order to find out that, we recruited an additional sample of children, about 100 children, who had ADHD and or, uh, or dyslexia, and who did or did not play a musical instrument. And we compared this synchronization in the brain. And what we found was that this synchronization was only uh, half, um, half as big in those who played a musical instrument. So we really found that practicing has benefits for the auditory system in those children and that it helps in cases of ADHD and dyslexia. And um, it's well known from literature that the prevalence of so-called auditory processing disorders is quite low. It's about 2 to 3 percent. And so such people have problems uh, with s structuring their auditory environment. They don't have problems with their ears, but with their auditory brains. And it's known from literature, it's estimated that about half of the, of the children with ADHD and dyslexia also have su such subtle problems in auditory perception. And the difficulties are in um, fast under, um, understanding fast speech, for in instance, fast speech sounds like B and P, D and T, or G and K, like in this example here. P, B, P, B. And in turn, they may also encounter problems in their auditory attention and also in their auditory working memory. So what we also found in our study was that according to those um, brain measures, so according to this brain synchronization, um, it was possible to uh, predict with an accuracy of about 90% if a child has a developmental disorder like ADHD or dyslexia. And that was the case without any other knowledge. So we did not have any psychological tests for that or uh, questionnaires. It was just on the basis of this neural um, activation pattern. And so we think that there is a high potential to early recognize such central auditory processing uh, disorders in very young children in order to counteract later problems occurring in the context of ADHD and dyslexia. 
And so this is our vision for the next year for our research. We want to develop, men, uh, want to develop an early diagnostic tool um, to, dia uh, to identify such problems. Um, which are child-friendly and which may be used uh, before, skill, uh, be before school entrance, probably for large-scale screenings. So this is just an idea, but we want to pursue this. And this might provide support for the parents and for teachers. It may help them to adapt the environment to the children's special needs. And most importantly, it may help to uh, offer appropriate training in time, so in kindergartens or in primary school, before other problems become manifest. And that brings me now here to our last slide. Um, we all are born with a brain, and as we see from outside each brain, they look similar, but if you really look at the specific structures, you see that they differ. We, we found that in our auditory cortex. And yes, and, if, uh, in, and over time, this brain develops, so it becomes better in function, and we develop specific competences. But what we also found was that in the case of uh, music, a high musical aptitude, as represented by a large right Heschel's gyrus here, enhances the motivation to learn and practice a musical instrument. And we assume that this is not only the case in music, but also with other talents, that a high aptitude enhances the motivation of a child to practice a related skill. And it's all about motivation here. And we find that in turn, this motivation implements a positive learning circuit so that the brain becomes even more, more efficient as we have seen in the other data. So it's very important and crucial to recognize this motivation. And what does this mean for pedagogy? What does it mean for education? So it's really crucial that teachers recognize this motivation of the children and that they respond to it so that they do not tr treat every child in the same way, but have a look where, in which domain is this child highly motivated and really to encourage this child, because this may induce a self-learning circuit to further um, um, bring benefits for this child. But there are also children who are not motivated at all, who have developmental disorders. They are not interested in playing with sounds because they have made bad experiences. So in this case, it's highly important to recognize such auditory uh, deficits in time um, and to counteract them. And that may happen um, with early musical training programs in kindergartens, in primary schools, and that needn't be just a formal musical education. Uh, it's, I think it's more important that it really makes fun for the children, that they re really like to uh, to do that, and in playful situations, so that the motivation um, now can be re-established again. And so that may now again um, establish this uh, positive learning cy uh, cycle, so the children want to play with auditory stimuli, they play with um, language, sounds, and this in turn um, is beneficial for literacy and uh, so reading and writing skills of the children. And so it's beneficial for the whole learning um, history of this child. And now this is the end of the story. And um, I hope that I could give you a short, short impression that musical training is not only good for children who are highly talented, but also for, the, for those who have um, hearing problems or subtle hearing problems. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah.